And the Raiders. How are you doing today? Questions? You doing all right? All right is a word. What's that? All right is a word you could use. All right is a word? <laughs> no questions on the homework? Homework's going okay? I don't look at the homework. <laughs> so we've concentrated on doing some equation solving methods we'll come back to those uh, later on as well as doing some other new things as we go forward but one of the things i want to go back and check in chapter one is talk a little bit about some of the computational techniques uh, that we use to try to speed things along so, and also how the machine stores numbers. So those are the two big things that I want to get out of chapter one. Not, so we're not going to go through absolutely everything in chapter one. Uh, talk about, some, hit some of the big ideas. Some of the stuff you may have already seen before in other classes. Uh, we'll talk about how we can implement some things both in R, hopefully, and in Excel. That's the idea. So um, we already talked a little bit about Taylor series the other day, but just to remind about Taylor series. So when we have a Taylor series, oops, mm -hmm. you talk about what I'm talking about the Taylor series of the Taylor series for F centered at, say, x equal to a. <clears throat> Remember when we write that out, the idea behind getting a Taylor series for a function is to represent the function as what I like to think of as an infinitely long polynomial. Because polynomials are things that we can evaluate relatively easily just by using essentially addition. Now maybe we have to repeat addition a lot to be able to do it, but think about the only operation that you really need to do to, to evaluate polynomials is add things. Subtraction is adding backwards, multiplication is adding quickly, division is adding backwards quickly, exponentiation is add really fast, right? Okay. Pretty much the only thing that you really need to know how to do to do a polynomial is add. So that computer is like that because computers are able to add by turning all remember all your computer can do, all your calculator can do is switch switches on and off. That's all it knows how to do. Right? On off. Okay. Anything that a computer is able to compute, it has to be able to do it in an on-off fashion. Maybe a really complex the way to do it, but that's how it has to do it. Okay. So you can program on all, you can program addition on off, okay? But you cannot program sine of an angle on off, okay? All right, so we need to have ways to do these computations as close as we'd ever like, but using things that only use on off ideas, and in particular addition for us. So that's what the Taylor series tries to do, is it tries to give us a long polynomial that will approximate, well, uh, should, hopefully it would equal if you go out infinitely long, but should approximate whatever value we're trying to plug in. So when we talk about centered at A, the way we calculate our Taylor series is, well, the first term, excuse me, the constants better match, right? If I plug in A into the function, I better get, well, I get A in this side, right? So that's where the F of A part comes in. So that's just matching what the function value is. But that's not a very good approximation for the function overall because if I just evaluate, or sorry, if I just approximate by using the constant function, all I have is a horizontal line approximating it, right? So the next approximation we try is make sure we get a linear approximation and put the derivative in there, right? So the next piece in there really does just look like the tangent line. That would be our linear approximation. What this does is it equates function value and equates the slope, right? 
If I take the derivative of both sides, this term goes away. Derivative of this is just one, so we end up with f prime of a on the right-hand side. So if I plug in a to both sides, the derivatives match. All right, so we're a little bit better. We've matched function value and slope, but not all functions are linear. So we do the same process again, right? We try to approximate the bendiness of it. So the second term that pops in here ends up being the second derivative evaluated a over two, x minus a squared. The reason why it needs to be over two is because I need to cancel out this power when I take two derivatives, right? Take the first derivative and the two will cancel, take the second derivative and then the whole thing goes away. If I take two derivatives of each of these, they go completely away. So after two derivatives, I just end up with f prime, double prime of a on the right hand side. So if I plug in a on the left hand side, I get the same value. So now we've equated function value, slope, and bendiness. Technical math term, bendiness. Okay. All right. And then we do, like, we just keep this process up, right? So we'll match up third derivatives, match up fourth derivatives, and keep going as far as we can or as far as we need. Out of my way. Did I move this the other day? I kept bumping something. I kept erasing things. <laughs> I was just teaching yesterday. All right, so we continue. We do the nth derivative evaluated at a. If I want to make sure that the nth derivatives match up, when I take n derivatives on the right-hand side, I better cancel out all of the powers that come down, right? When I take the n down, I was left with an n minus 1. I need to bring the n minus 1 down and have an n minus 2. I end up with n factorial that needs to be canceled out on the bottom, right? So I end up with n factorial here times x minus a to the n, and so on down the line. Like I said, we briefly hinted at Taylor series the other day when we were looking at the error, uh, how the error changes for Newton's method. We went through that the other day. But this is what a Taylor series looks like generally. Now again, if you've got functions that you're trying to approximate, if you've got functions that you're trying to approximate, these functions may not ever have derivatives that go to zero. Certainly polynomials do. Right? If you differentiate any polynomial enough times, it just disappears. Right? But in general, if you had something like e to the x or sine x, those functions never ever go away as the more you differentiate. So this process would never end, which is also a bad thing for computers. Right? These processes need to stop at some point. So eventually, pardon me, we would want to cut this off at some point and use just that polynomial to help us evaluate an approximation for whatever we're trying to get at. That can be determined by a number of things. How willing you are to accept error, what, at what tolerance level you're willing to accept. Uh, it also could be just uh, simply by machine representation. Eventually, uh, if you're close to the center, eventually these terms aren't going to be adding anything. Right? We're going to talk a little bit about machine representation of numbers, and eventually you get out so far that not, the machine just turns, turns it into zero. Okay. All right. In any event, pardon me. <coughs> the idea here is that we would need to chop this off at some point and get us uh, an approximation for uh, what the function looks like. And again, it looks like a polynomial, right? Now, notice that to be able to compute these things, I need to be able to compute this many derivatives. However, they should be equal as far as we have polynomials. So what we're going to talk a little bit about today is how can we quickly evaluate these uh, if we have a polynomial idea, if we want to shift the polynomial from, uh, say, put, putting in zero to center it somewhere else. So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. All right. So in any event, when we chop this off at a particular power of n, we refer to that as the nth degree Taylor polynomial. 
Oops. Oops, gosh darn it. I keep forgetting to write of f of x. I don't know what was my problem is today. So if the nth degree Taylor polynomial of f of x centered at x equal to a is just, we write this piece out. up until the power of n, and then we quit. That's all we mean by the nth degree Taylor polynomial. Hopefully, the values that we get out are close to what the true value is for the function. That's the whole point. One of the things that we talk about briefly in <coughs> calculus is looking at these Taylor polynomials and noticing that when we are close to the center, the values are good. But the farther away you get from the center, the approximation not be, may not be as good. Okay. So to illustrate what I mean by that, let's do a couple of um, a couple of quick examples on the grass. And we'll, like, I know these people are still writing, so I'm not switching the window over so you can still see it. Again, the reason why I'm recording things in case people are ill, that's why I keep doing it on the screen here. And again, if there's something you want to go back to lecture and look at, then you can go look at the recording. I hope it's okay to do it this way. Yes, good. Yeah, okay, good. If not, throw something at me. I don't care. <laughs> boo me. Booing's always good. Anytime I make an error, boo, right? Okay. All right. Anyway, let me go over to uh, let's go over to Desmos real quick because I can graph pretty quickly. Basically, I'm just doing this to illustrate. So let's say we do e to the x because there's a there's a function that's not a polynomial. Let's just start putting in some uh, Taylor polynomials because e to the x, if you remember. Uh, back from either Cal 2 or Cal 3, if you've studied Taylor series. Remember e to the x, Taylor series, uh, Maclaurin series, Taylor series centered at zero, is just one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over six. It's just x to the n over n factorial is e to the terms. Okay. So let's, if we do one plus x, there's its tangent line, right? But if I do one plus x plus x squared over two, Gives me a little bit better approximation, right? Matches the bend. If I, I'll not put some more, uh, whole bunch of more terms on here. I'll just change. Oops. Uh, the function. Now it's even a little bit better, right? So I've got a little bit better approximation as I'm going along, right? I can just keep adding terms on the end here. Even better. But notice that no matter what polynomial I use, period, doesn't matter what polynomial I use, you know from n behavior of polynomials, either both tails point the same direction, the degree is even, or they point in opposite direction as the degrees are odd. Right? Okay? In particular, if I look at the left hand side, eventually you're going to go far enough out that that approximation is going to stay. Right? So the idea behind this, what we're going to talk about today, is well, if I start with an approximation that's close at zero, can I change it to an approximation that's close at three? Can we shift it? Okay. So what we're going to talk about is how we can come, uh, shift polynomials that are centered at zero to being centered somewhere else. Okay. So that you don't have to recalculate a Taylor series every single time if you already know the Maclaurin series for that particular polynomial or for, excuse me, for that particular function. So we'll talk about how we can, if I want an approximation over here, can I take this approximation that we already have and move it so that it's nice over here too? Okay. That's the idea. So you get, the item, what I'm talking about here is that you get an approximation that's really good for things that are really, really close to, say, zero, and use that 
to shift where I want so you don't have to recalculate a whole bunch of derivatives all the time. Because notice that, again, either I've got to put a whole bunch more terms out to try to get this really, really close to, say, approximate e to the negative 3, right? I've either got to do a whole bunch more terms or I've got to move my approximation. Let me, let me see what I'm saying. I have to compute more and more terms to try to get my approximation to get better and better. Say, if I want to go approximate e to the negative 3 here, I'm already at four derivatives, and the approximation still sucks, right? How many more how many more derivatives would I have to do to where I would be bending this polynomial down close enough to that negative three spot, the x equal to negative three spot, that I would be happy with that approximation? Versus, could I just work off this approximation that we already have and shift, and then make my approximation okay? That makes sense. So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. All right. In order to be able to do that, oops, that's not what I wanted to click on. We need to go back to something you've probably already learned back in high school algebra. We probably talked about synthetic division, right? Okay. It's also referred to as Horner's algorithm. So Horner's algorithm. Or synthetic division basically is a quick way to evaluate polynomials at a particular point. You probably used it to look for all of the roots of a polynomial, which is what we typically teach it in college algebra here is that you're trying to figure out all the roots of a polynomial, all the places where it crosses the x-axis. And this is just a quick way to be able to do that. Not only does it give you the value of the polynomial at a particular point, but it also gives you the coefficients of the division. Right? So the reason why we like Horner's algorithm. So let's figure out or remind ourselves what it is. And basically, when you do Horner's algorithm, it's a nested, uh, <coughs> pardon me, it's basically writing it as a nested multiplication idea. So let's just as an example. Let's say we had the polynomial. I'm going to write it in reverse order. Let's say I had 4 plus um, 7x minus 9x squared plus 3x cubed uh, plus 2x to the fourth. Let's say this is our polynomial. Notice that if I want to evaluate this for any particular value of x, let's think about how many computations you would actually have to do. First, notice that we've got definitely one, two, three, four additions that we'll have to do. All right. So let's look at the multiplications. Well, each of the coefficients count as a multiplication, but each individual power tells you how many multiplications you would have to do, right? This will require this, so this term would require two, uh, one multiplication, the seven times the x. This actually has two multiplications in it because you have to do nine times x times another x. <coughs> this one's going to have three multiplications. This will have four multiplications. <coughs> and so notice that you're going up each degree that you have adds an extra multiplication just for those terms. So from a computational standpoint, there's a lot more multiplications you have the higher the degree you go. So the idea behind Horner's algorithm is to cut down on the number of computations that we actually have to do. Okay. And the way that works is, well, notice that if I ignore this term and just look at these, do you see anything that you can factor out? An x, good. So I just did that the first time. Now do the exact same idea again here. If I ignore the 7, do you see anything we can factor out of the rest of the terms? An x, right? And you can continue to do this, right? So notice that if I do this several times, I can have 4 plus x times 7 minus x times 9 plus x times 3 plus 2x. Say so I close them all. 
So we've written this as nested multiplications. And if you remember how Horner's algorithm worked or synthetic division worked, remember you took your whatever you're plugging in for your x, you multiplied it by the high the leading coefficient, added it to the next coefficient, it multiplied it by the leading coefficient, added, multiply, add, right? Well, we're going to write it out and log in here in a second, but that's the idea. Now let's count multiplication, uh, count number of computations. Well, we didn't cut down on the number of additions because I still have to add one, two, three, four times. We didn't cut down the number of additions, but let's count number of multiplications that we actually have to do. One, two, three, four is all. Right. Notice over here again we had to do one, two, three, four for each of those terms. There were ten multiplications. Only four here. Okay. If you were to add a fifth, uh, an x to the fifth term here, you would add five more multiplications for a total of fifteen versus only five here. Right. So Horner's algorithm significantly reduces the number of multiplications you have. If you've done any type of computational complexity arguments, doing the number of multiplications here would be on the order of n squared, n times n plus 1 over 2. This would be on the order of n. You're cutting down your computational time. As a matter of fact, I was talking with Dr. Roth about this this morning. This is so prevalent in doing the computational uh, stuff that Horner's algorithm is actually hardwired into chips. Very good. This is the best, well, the reason why it's hardwired is because this is the best case scenario for being able to evaluate a polynomial. Polynomial degree n can be done with n additions and n multiplications. And that's the lowest you could possibly go. So that's why it's, it's hardwired in there. So anyway, but this is the premise behind it. Usually when you write Horner's, <coughs> I can talk. Horner's algorithm out, remember you usually put some number up in the upper left hand corner and then write the coefficients across in uh, from leading coefficient down right so two three negative nine seven four let's say if we wanted to do uh evaluate the polynomial at two so remember again the reason why we write it this way uh we have that leading coefficient we don't have to do anything to the leading coefficient first, so we just bring it down. And then 2 times the 2 would be 4. So this is playing the role of the x, right? I'm putting the 2 in here. We bring it up here because now we add these two things together, the 3 plus the 4. I'm assuming this should look familiar, yes? I mean, it may have been a while. You're dusting off cobwebs and wherever it is in your brain's attic. But we've seen this before, right? Add down, this is what this says, right? Do the 3 plus the 2 times it. Multiply. Here's where the x is, right? So we multiply by whatever we're plugging in for the x. Now add, what was it? Uh, add down. Notice my negative is out in front here. So uh, add down. I probably should add a plus and a negative there. Actually, I should have had a plus and a negative there. I factored that out. Uh, five, multiply, add, multiply, add. Yes? The two. The two times the two is a four, two times the seven is a 14. The two times the five is a 10. That's what I'm multiplying, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So this 2 here is what we're plugging in for the x. So I'm taking that x times that coefficient, the x times the sum of, so that 2 times the, the 2 times that here is where the 4 is going. All right, so that's what we've computed here. Then we add down, that's the result. I'm multiplying the same x. I'm putting that here. Then we add, and that's the result. So then I'm multiplying by the same x here. One o'clock. 
the number at the end here gives you the function value. Right? Number at the end gives you the function value. Not only that, this also gives you the coefficients of the quotient. And what we mean by that is, why did it disappear? Didn't I, did I just underline that? This gives you the coefficients of the quotient. And what I mean by that is, my original function was what? It was a 2x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 9x squared plus 7x plus 4. We've divided this by x minus 2. This is the quotient, the 2x uh, cubed plus 7x squared plus 5x plus 17. And then we get a remainder of 38. The x minus 2. So we put a plug into here, it has the same effect as dividing it by x minus 2. So it's always x minus whatever you plug in. It's always x minus whatever you plug in. Always that. <coughs> The reason why I want x minus that is because remember, if I plug in 2 on this side, I better get the same thing as if I plug in 2 on this side. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right. So let's see if we can pop this into Excel and see if we can get Excel to do this for us quickly. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can get R to do it. We have to be a little bit more tricky, well, not tricky, but we can still do the same idea. All right, so we'll go over to Excel. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can actually see what's going on. Now I have to remember what the coefficients were. What did I have? Two, seven, negative nine, three, and what was the last one? Four, is that right? Are those are the coefficients I had? Okay. All right. So up here in the upper left-hand corner, I'm going to put a border around it just so that we can see it here. Uh, right. Let's make it. Let's go to more borders. Let's make it. Oops, not that. Let's make it thick on the right. In the. Oops. In the bottom. And I plugged in two, right? Just trying to set it off. Let me see what's going on. Bless you. And here. My three and the seven are flipped. Three here and seven here. Oh, yeah, they were. Thank you. Oh, for heaven's sake. What's that? I know it's Oh, gotcha. Thanks. I just didn't remember what I wrote. <laughs> so what do you get? What, what happens when you make things up off the top of your head? You just go to another page you don't have written in front of you. You don't, see, you don't remember what it was. All right. So if I'm putting this into Excel, remember again, the first thing I want to do is just bring this number down. Right? So I can just use the cell reference is equal to that. Yeah. Okay, just hit enter. Now up here, we want to take that and multiply it by that, right? Now before you hit enter, I want to, the whole reason why we're using cell references here is so that we can copy and paste and let Excel change everything, right? In particular, the number that's here all the way across should get multiplied by that 2 every single time, right? So I don't want to just, but remember if I just copy this across, it's going to change these by relative 
uh, where they are. That's, that's the whole idea of a relative cell reference, right? Right now, the way this is written, it says take the number that's right diagonally below me and multiply it by the number that's left two and up one. So if you were just to take this and copy it over to the right, it would change B to C, right? Because that would be the one that's right below it, right? But it would also change the A1 to C1. It'll be moved over again, right? Because it's going left to and up one, where it says to do, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want the A to change at all. I want it to stay the same, correct? So that's when we change it from a relative to an absolute cell reference. You can do dollar signs and type them in. Or again, if you want the quick, if you use your function key, F4 will cycle through all of them. Okay. Now, again, if I leave it like this, it will keep both the A and the 1 the same, which works for this particular problem because I don't want, I want to refer to the same cell. But here in a minute, I'm going to want to copy everything down as well. I want the A not to move, but the row number I do want to move. So I want a dollar sign on just the A, but not the 1. Okay. We'll see why here in a minute. Now, it may take longer than a minute, but we'll see here in a, uh, in a minute. So again, I hit F4 again. It cycled to just the dollar sign on the one, which is the exact opposite of what I want. Hit it one more time, and it'll do it. Or you can just type in dollar sign. At that point, since I did it three times, I will just type in the dollar sign. All right. This one, all I want to do is just add down, right? So this will be equal to this plus this. Whoops. I want to type in the C2. That's... So this is not letting me click on it. Now we should just be able to copy across. I highlight both of those and copy to the right. Should fill everything into what we got. Does this look, look, look familiar? I hope. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Before not even going off the camera. <laughs> Striking resemblance to things that were I know it's been a while. So like I said, we teach it in college algebra here. There's probably a lot of maybe alpha two or pre calc or something along those lines. We probably haven't used it since. That sounds about right, right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is the idea. So again, remember that this is not only are we figuring out the function value, because that's from the nested the nested additions that we did, just flipping back over again. Not only did we figure out the function value, we also figured out these coefficients from the division, correct? Right? Okay. And if you go through the long division, you can kind of see why it works that way. But again, it's a little bit quicker to go through Horner's algorithm, because again, all you're doing is one multiplication, one addition, one multiplication, one addition at each step. Okay. If you think about what you had to do for long division, even, you figure out a multiplication that goes all the way through the thing you're dividing by, and then addition all the way down, and you keep doing that over and over again. So again, from, even from a division standpoint, it's not as computationally expensive. <laughs> All right. If we want to implement this in R, at least the way that I thought about it to start with, a little bit more involved, but I do want to talk about it a little bit because it's going to give us a couple of commands that we can learn, mainly for any other purpose here. All right. So, what we're going to uh, pass through here for this particular function is uh, 
we're going to do this for the um, coefficients of the function. So even though I don't have this uh, written down yet, let me just talk about what we're going to pass here. I'll just call it, um, I'll just call it coefficients for that. All right. So rather than, I mean, there's probably ways that we can do this, but at least in R, from what I've experienced so far, it's a little more complicated. So rather than passing it as a the actual polynomial itself, what we're going to do is just pass it a list of the coefficients. And actually, one of the kind of the default things in R seems to be using lists as a basic structure. Uh, remember when we graphed functions <clears throat> using the curve command? And we had to set the le x limits and the y limits. We could set the x limits and y limits, and we used the c of, and then we had the lower and upper limits for that. That c of thing is what's making a list in, in, uh, in R. Okay. So we're going to use that idea here that when we pass through something, uh, something with Horner's algorithm, we're going to pass through a list of coefficients. Of course, if I'm using Horner's algorithm, I better also pass it a value and plug it in, right? So let's call that, and put a comma in here, and I'll just call it value. And now what we're going to do is that we're going to create a new list from old list. And you, if you're uh, more versed at programming, you might think of faster ways to do these kind of things. I just want to get the answer out and work with it from there, and then talk about going forward with new stuff that we're going to talk about. So I want to create a new list that gives me the coefficients. Okay? So the first thing I want to do is define an empty list. And I'm just going to refer to it as answer, just for lack of a better term. If I want an empty list, again, that C command tells me that I'm creating a list of something. To make it empty, I'll just put open and shut parentheses with nothing in between them. So this is where we're going to store our new coefficients, right? Okay. All right. So... This is going to be our coefficient. So literally what I want to store in here, if I go back over to Excel real fast, and I'll come right back. What I want to store are these values here. Okay. Well, notice that our first step in Horner's algorithm was just to bring that down, right? Okay. Okay. So... Actually, I probably get an extra step in here that I don't need. I created an empty list, and I'm going to do, but the reason why I'm doing this is to just show you a new command. I'm going to, again, I'm going to want to keep adding things to the same list. I'm going to use what's referred to as the append command. And I know if you're used to a Python, I think if you already have something with a list, you can just do dot append on the end and it'll stick it on there. That doesn't seem to work in R. I tried it, it doesn't work. At least it didn't work for me. So, uh, when you do the append command in here, you're going to need to tell it where you're going to append, what list you're going to append it to, and what you're going to append. Okay. <laughs> so, I want to, again, append it to the same list. So, I'm going to refer to itself. And then I want to append just the very, very first thing that pops up in my coefficient list, right? Because all we did was that Horner's algorithm was take the first coefficient and just drop it, right? The way we refer to elements in a list in R is to put brackets around it. And this is also something that's a little bit different than Python. What's the first element in a list? What index number is it? Guess what it is here? One, yeah. <laughs> So that will that'll take the first coefficient and pop it into your list. Okay. So 
If you want to put, this will actually put it at the end of the list. That's what append does. If you want to put it at a specific position in the list, you can put an extra argument on the end. If you want something at the front of the list, you would use zero to put it at the front of the list. So if you're familiar with stacks at all, if you want to push something onto the stack, it would be putting it, if you think about a list as a stack, it'd be pushing it on at zero. Usually front or back is where you typically put things in the list, but you can put it wherever you want. Okay. Um, one of the nice things about R that if you play with it, you want to put something on the end of the list and you put some number that's way past the length of the list, it'll just still stick it on the end. It won't give you an error. All right, so that was the first thing we wanted to do. And again, I could have just, uh, and this is, I only wanted to do this because I wanted to illustrate the append command to start with. It also showed that you can make an empty list. This is actually unnecessary, right? I could just delete this line and, uh, or not delete this line. I could delete this whole line and just put coefficient of one in here. It would just create a row just to start with. I can do that also. So really I've got an extra line here that I don't need. But again, I just wanted to illustrate both of these things at the same time. It was more pedagogy than it was programming technique. Right? I could have just put literally put this right here inside those parentheses. It would have had the same effect as these two lines do. So this is longer than it needs to be. So for those of you who are better programmers than me, don't yell at me, I know. All right. So, what do we want to do next? Well, we want to run through the rest of the list. We want to run through the rest of the list and multiply and add what we're putting in, correct? Okay. So, we've done while loops, which gave us a condition to tell us how long we wanted to run a condition for. In this case, I think it's probably easier to use a for loop, a for loop because there's also a command in R that tells us how long the list is. Okay, so for a loop, we'll tell, we'll give it a specific length of time to put in numbers in and then run through the loop each time. Uh, remember again, I need parentheses around things because the default constructions in R is everything is a function, so it has inputs that go in. Okay, um, just pick some name for a counter. I'll say I. Um, with everything, again, like I said, it seems like everything in R, the default construction is a list. In the in command for uh, is pretty common for saying something is in a list. Uh, just like in Python, if you're familiar with Python, you can iterate over a list. That's not what we're going to do here, but you can, if you have a list that you want to iterate across, you can do that here as well. Here, I want to iterate across numbers. I've already taken care of the first coefficient. Right? I've already put it on my answer list. So I want to start my for loop with the second one. Okay? So I'll start at two and I'll go to the length oops, of my coefficient list. So the length command is a built in function that tells you how many elements are in there. And since we started counting at one for the first element of the list, we don't have to do a we don't have to worry about a minus one like we would have to worry about in Python, right? So the first the the length gives you the actual length of the list, but in Python it counts the first one as zero, so the last one is the length minus one. We have to adjust that one in Python. But this one we don't have to adjust. All right. So. We want to run through all the way down through our coefficient list here. What do we want to do? This is the number we want to plug in. Whatever the coefficient is, what do we want to do with whatever the coefficient is in our polynomial? What do we want to do with the value? Multiply them together, right? And then add it to what? The next coefficient, right? Okay. So, whatever the coefficient is, so let's append this again. So, let's go back over to Excel and see what our answers were, right? 
this number got multiplied by the two, right? Whatever the answer, the previous answer was, we multiplied it and then we added it to that coefficient, right? Okay. And then again, this was the previous answer. That was that what we, we wanted to append, correct? So we want to multiply by whatever the previous thing was and add the new one, don't we? So what do you think we should type in here to do that? We value time something, yep. Okay, so if we're going in two, it would be answer one, right? If it were three, it would be answer two. So in general, it would be answer I minus one, right? The previous one, right? We should have already stored it somewhere, correct? Okay. And then what we want to add to that? Yeah, the coefficient of i, correct? We want to do the previous answer times whatever the value is and add the, and the, add the coefficient in the polynomial to it, right? And we should do that all the way through the length of our coefficients. Yeah. Okay. And then at the very, very end here, let's just return our answer. Oops. Answer. And give it a run and see what happens. Fourth thing that happens is it crashes. It happens. If you've written in code, and every time you've written your code, it works perfectly the first time, <laughs> you're a heck of a lot better than I am. What's that? I, that I don't think that person exists. <laughs> yeah. If that person exists, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> it's really, really easy to do. All right. So remind me again what the coefficients were. Oh, you've got a, uh, we need uh, the previous, we need the answer of I minus one. Yeah, so the thing you've already computed, you want to go grab it and multiply that value. That's what's going on. Yep. I didn't change anything in the report. Okay. What were the coefficients again, since I can't seem to remember them? Okay. All right, so notice that I've put that in a list. So I've got. C of two, three, negative nine, seven, four. Those are the coefficients that we had for our polynomials. And then the value we plugged in was two. Yeah. If everything works right, we should get the same, they should have the same line that we got when we did Excel. Well, a moment of truth here. Hey, look at that. What's that? Oh, oh man. Oh. 
Better? You see it now? Yeah. What? How do I know myself? Yeah. I don't. I mess up all the time. You gotta remember. You gotta remember. I practiced this before I came in. I didn't just come in here and just do this cold. <laughs> I, I probably written this particular algorithm six or seven times to do it over and over again. Make sure I remember. Hey, I remember how to do Horner's algorithm really well. I don't know. Your lab? Huh? Before in your class? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't want to waste the time. I don't want to waste the time at your time in class screwing up the program. I want to make sure that I can actually go do it, right? I mean, it takes me like ten minutes to do that six times. I just want to make sure that I do it right. Everybody else getting it okay? Okay. okay. All right. So there is probably easier, uh, better ways to do this. I just want to make sure that we understand the algorithm. And a lot of times, one of the best ways to learn how an algorithm works is to try to program the algorithm and see what happens. As well as doing that too. Right? So we're spending time on the program. Not spending a lot of time on the error checking, I know. Not a very good program, I know. Trust me, I know I'm not a very good program. Fine. All right, any questions on the algorithm itself? How we're doing? What's the coefficient of the one? What's the thing? So the coefficient of the one, again, remember that our first step was just to take the first coefficient and bring it down. This is just representing your leading coefficient of your polynomial and bringing them down. So the first thing it's doing is just storing that first coefficient. So what if you change that? Change that this to a different number? Yeah. If you change it to a two, it would grab your, well, we did a fourth degree polynomial, so we grab the coefficient on the third degree term. So what do we have first? Oh, yep. So the, the list that we wrote is this one. If you change this initially to a two, it would grab the three instead of a two. Oh, bring it down first. And bring it down first. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's what that would do. Now again, remember we're assuming that everything's written the way we would want it to be written for this particular list, right? We've got the coefficients written in the correct order in decreasing degree terms. That's, that's the assumption we're making. That's why I said we're not doing any error checking, right? It would be nice if you were programming this that you could take a symbolic polynomial, figure out what the degree terms are, pick off the coefficients, and put them in the right order before you run it through the algorithm. You could say the user inputted the coefficients and then you took it out. It sounds like bigger project thing to do than what I'm interested in doing right now. I just want to literally get the code written up. However, if you want to take something and extend it to something like that, if you're comfortable with your program, you want to do some extension things, you want to do extra credit, I'm happy with that. And it doesn't have to be written in R, by the way. You could write a Python program that does Horner's algorithm, or you could just have the user enter an arbitrary polynomial with X's in it in any whatever order you want, and it fills it out and gets it. Be a good little program. Or you know, have a GUI and kind of say, okay, put in the put in the degree and then it spits out all the terms that you need and you go through and type in the coefficients and that's that way. They're a good little program. Those are good little extra credit type of programs if you're interested. You don't have to use that, but I'm just saying if you were. That's fine. <laughs> Do I do that? Absolutely. practice for different things. Alright, any questions on that at all? For the algorithm? Okay, first. Any questions on how the algorithm works? Literally by hand. Any questions on how the algorithm works? You okay with that? How about the Excel size? Is that okay? 
The Excel side is probably a little better than the R side, yeah? So, why do we care? <laughs> Besides the fact that it's computationally faster, why do we care? So, let's tie this back to the Taylor series idea that we started off this entire discussion with. Okay? So, remember again, when we did Taylor series, we know that the Taylor series centered at a particular value looks like this, right? So, it looks like a polynomial centered at. This x equal to r so it tells you that a it looks like this we've got powers of x minus a. But when we're talking about these particular polynomials, we've got things that are centered. Let's think, when I think about this particular polynomial. This thing looks like it's centered at zero, right? Well, what would happen if we wanted to shift this polynomial from being centered at zero to centered at, say, some a? Okay. Well, let's think about what's going on here. Okay. Let's say we had, I'm going to stick with this specific example. I start with 2x to the fourth plus 3x cubed, 9x squared plus 7x plus 4. And I want it to be same degree polynomial, but I want it centered at a different value. So rather than having it centered at zero, which is what this looks like, right? Let's say we want to center it at 4. It's made up 4. Ah, not 4. Let's center it at 2 since we already divided it by 2. Okay? Let's say we want to center it at 2. What I mean by that is I want to rewrite this as some coefficient times x minus 2 to the 4th plus some coefficient times x minus 2 cubed some coefficient times x minus 2 squared, some coefficient times x minus 2, and then some constant coefficient. This is what I mean by shift the polynomial from being centered at 0, because I have just powers of x minus nothing, right? I've got just x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared, and so on down the line. Instead of having it centered at 0, I want to center it at 2. Okay. All right. So notice that right away, if I plug in 2 in the left-hand side, I need to get the same thing as if I plug in 2 on the right-hand side, right? Well, what do each of these coefficients here, ding, 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 not those coefficients, what are each of these numbers equal to if I plug in 2 root x? Zero. So what does this c sub 0 have to be? If I plug in 2 on this side, it has to be the same as 2 on this side. What did you get when you plugged in 2 on this side? 38. So what does C, not, C sub 0 have to be? 38. Fantastic. Good. Okay. So we already know that our C0 has to be 38. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we've already divided out the x minus 2 to the 4th, right? I already divided out the x minus 2 to the 4th. Or sorry, not x minus 2. We've already divided out 1x minus 2 here, correct? Okay. So if you divide both sides by the x minus 2, uh, if we leave this part off here, if I just divide what, um, think about it this way. If I subtract off 38 here, so drop off the constant term, if I subtract the 38 off here, so ignore that for the time being, okay? If I drop off the constant term and then divide by the x minus 2, notice it'll cancel each of those out, doesn't it? Right? So if you take that uh, 2x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 9x squared plus 7x, and then it'd be a negative 34. Don't worry about the number. It's just I'm subtracting 38 from both sides. Because then I want it evenly divisible by x minus 2. We end up with c4x minus 2 cubed c3 times x minus 2 Oops, I didn't do it. I don't know what that button does then. Squared. Uh, C2 
times x minus 2 plus c1. All right, that's what we have to get. We agree? Yeah? Okay. So if I divide by that x minus 2 after I subtracted the constant off, that's where that minus 34 comes from. Don't worry about the minus 34, okay? I'm just ignoring the constant. If I ignore the constant and divide, this is what we have to get, correct? Okay. Well, notice again, when we did, did the division, remember doing the division in the Horner's algorithm, it gave us these coefficients for the quotient, right? Yeah, it gave us those coefficients for the quotient. So if I want to figure out what the C1 is, again, this C1 is, I can just do Horner's algorithm again on this polynomial and figure out what the answer is, and that will give you the C1. Plugging in 2 in for my x, I can run Horner's algorithm through this again, and it'll give me what the C1 has to be. Because again, if I, if I plug in 2 on the left-hand side, it has to be the same thing as when I get 2 on the right-hand side. And all these 2s will cancel, and so that'll give me C1. Drop that constant off again, do it again, that'll give me the C2, and I keep going until I run out of terms. Okay? So when I go back over to Excel now, and can I get rid of some of these? Oh, ignore the lines. <laughs> see if I can erase some of these lines since I was circling. Oh, hey, that was fast. Cool, got rid of the lines. All right, so I'm going to bring this down here. We're going to ignore the 38, okay? All I'm going to do is copy this piece without the constant part, right? I'm going to hit copy and paste it right here. And we just got Horner's algorithm again for that next piece. I ignored the 38, right? But this should be doing the same. And this is why we use that absolute cell reference, but not uh, on the column, but not the row. Right, because I wanted to copy down to what I was talking about last time, right? Yeah. Okay. Does this look all right for doing Horner's algorithm on the two on that new polynomial? Bring down the two, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. Right? So this gives us that next coefficient of 71. Guess what? We can do it again, right? I'll copy the two. Again, ignore the constant. Bring it down. The next one is going to be 57. Do it one more time. Ignore the constant. Or that C3 will be 19. Could you like go back and read that? Because I got lost there. All right. Sorry. Why are you sorry? So we, we, <laughs> I don't know why you're sorry for asking a question. <laughs> All right. This is where we started, right? Yeah. Okay. I want to do Horner's algorithm again, but ignore the constant. I don't want the 38 in there, right? I'm trying to figure out what the C1 would be. Okay. So all I did was. Actually, it'd probably even be better rather than copying it down. I could just hit equals that, and then I can not have to. Then we can change it, and it'll change it. Uh, the, high, oh, the idea behind this would be just changing it. The um, put a little bracket. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't have to put the bracket in there. All right. What am I doing? Why am I on draw? Okay. All right. So all I did was. Copy this chunk. That was the computational part for our Horner's algorithm, right? Just that part. I'm just going to copy and paste it right below that too. Okay. Oops. Must have hit cut. What are you doing? I don't want to cut. I must have hit cut. Copy. Paste. There we go.
Não? All right, everybody else okay getting to this point? Okay, same process for the next one. I'll just copy paste that number, copy, paste, do it one more time to here. And copy, oops, and paste. All right. Everybody okay to these, this one? I'm going to ask you to read the numbers off here in a second. Okay. You okay with that? Okay. All right. <clears throat> C0, C1, C2, C3, C4. All right, so read those off to me when I go back over to write it down, <laughs> okay? All right, so what we get at the very end is our 2x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus nx squared plus 7x plus 4 is 2 times x minus 2 to the fourth. The next one was 19, is that right? x minus 2 cubed, don't remember. 57, thank you. Next one was 71. And the last one was 38, yes? Oops. The two and a one. Oh. Two. <laughs> All right. The reason why I went back and was changing changing it to a, a cell reference versus a just copy the paste of the two down every time. One of the reasons why I wanted to do that was if I go now if I go back up to the top and say I want to recenter it somewhere else. It should change everything for me. So that's all the coefficients of centering it at negative four. Oops. Or six. I can just change that number and it'll change each, each time when it's set up this way. This was a, for a fourth degree polynomial, but if you copy things to the right, you can make this for any higher degree polynomial that you want. It's easy to change pretty quickly. I don't think I still told you why we care. All right, let's think about why we care. I started all of this off by talking about Taylor series, right? Remember, Taylor series are important to help us get polynomial approximations to functions. Well, when we were doing that graph, <clears throat> pardon me, when we were doing the graph for e to the x, That was what our graph looked like, right? And we said that it's centered here at zero. Doesn't help us very much if we center it at three. So can I recenter the polynomial to help us get a better approximation when we're closer to negative three versus when we're closer to zero? And so that's the whole idea about what we want to do this is we can start shifting our polynomials around and help us out. In particular, notice that um, if I go back over to this, oops. Notice that this 
expression here is the Taylor series for the polynomial at 2. If Taylor, if, if a Taylor, uh, sorry, it, well, it is the Taylor series. If a Taylor series exists for a function, then I know that the coefficients have to be what they are for the derivatives. So what I mean by that is these particular numbers here have to be the derivatives of this function at 2 uh, over, uh, they have to be the Taylor coefficients. So this 71 here has to be f prime of x at 2. It has to be f prime of 2. Right? The 57 has to be f double prime of 2 over 2. So we can recover the derivatives quickly as well. All right, so again, if we can recenter the polynomials at a different value, <clears throat> pardon me, then we can actually get these values to help us out and do things calculations quickly when we're close to those centers. And that's the whole point of being able to recenter the value. So that's why we care about those particular ideas, is being able to do this recentering idea. And it's, it's important to be able to do that idea if we can. Uh, If we can recenter it, then it allows us to get those values a little bit more quickly and helps us evaluate things. Rather than trying to take more terms out, we can just shift where we are. And that's the whole point. Any questions on doing that at all? all right. So again, these values here have to be the right derivatives at a particular value. So the, what I'm saying here is that this is the Taylor series. Just write it down. This is the Taylor series for this polynomial. Centered at x equal to 2. So in particular, f prime of 2, if I call this my f of x, my f prime of 2 has to be 71. My f double prime of 2 over 2 has to be 57. The coefficients have to match. f triple prime of 2 over 6 has to be 19. And we can check that easily, right? Because we can just take the derivatives and plug it in. So if we have a Taylor, if we have a polynomial expression centered at a thing that is equal to a function, then I know it has to be the Taylor series. Taylor series are unique. If they exist, Taylor series are unique. Okay? So the coefficients have to match. These are just the formulas for the coefficients for your Taylor series. So they have to match. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So we'll talk a little bit more about this next time as well as, like I said, we'll get into machine representation of numbers. You've got uh, homework due on Tuesday, right? So otherwise, have a good one. We'll see you on Tuesday, if not before. Some of you I'll see before Tuesday, but see you tomorrow. <laughs>